Hello and welcome to Legally Speaking with me Tarun Nangya. Now we begin the part two of our discussion on democracy, courts and rule of law. You've seen uh, Justice Sikri share the Indian example. Now a lot of my viewers, uh, our viewers, uh, not acquainted with what happens in USA. Could you share with us, uh, uh, have courts in USA been called upon to tackle this kind of crisis, uh, specifically with regards to governance, uh, specifically with regards to issues that people have. What has been the U.S. example or it differs state by state? Could you share with us? Thank you. Well, I'm happy to talk about some of the history of the rule of law in the United States. Yes. And let me say that in doing so, it's important to recognize, as Justice Sakri has said, <coughs> this concept that we share, as Justice Cooper said, of democracy being we the people, because that's a s powerful term. It means that there's an assumption that the people are not going to be protected if you only have the executive branch. Okay. Democracy is not going to be healthy if you only have the legislative branch. Yes. You need an institution called the judiciary that will guarantee the rights of, and this is where it gives me a, a lot of inspiration and as we say, chicken skin to think about, where does Mahatma Gandhi come from? Yes. Where does Ashoka come from? It comes from a history of standing up for the underprivileged and in a huge population called India. Yes. So let's move to the United States. We have the same assumption that we have to be careful about our government. Okay. The state, as Justice Sakri said, we have to be careful. careful. This underlines all the relationships between the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature. We have to be careful not to give government too much power. And the guardian <laughs> yes. of that are the men and women who are trained, and I, when I hear Justice Sakri, it's just an echo of the justices of the India Supreme Court who have been trained to be independent yes. and vigilant under, for example, public interest law, which has developed in a robust, powerful way in India and also has developed in the United States. But it means that people left out, people that are poor, people that are oppressed, have a voice with the courts. In terms of examples in the United States, imagine we had a history of slavery. Okay. What is the role of the court when you have the executive and the legislative branch that are pursuing the policy of slavery? It was challenged. Challenge, yes. At first, because of the pressure, institutional pressure, the yes. court said that slavery is constitutional. It that was hundreds of years yes. ago. Yes. Yes. But then it's a living constitution, then principles that are quite clear through, I think, a straightforward human conscience prevailed. And judges were independent and said that slavery, of course, is unconstitutional. If you move forward to an industrial era, this idea that there were poor people or children in factories that were being exploited they needed to be protected. There was legislation passed that went to the Supreme Court because the government, the executive, wanted no regulation of business because it might make business less efficient. The courts had to decide. And at first, okay. because the men and women came from this sort of industrial community, the courts said it's unconstitutional to regulate the conditions of children working in factories. Is it so? At the beginning. Yes. So when we look to India and we see the tradition of judges being so independent and willing to declare that the Constitution means you have a right to life, you have a right to a clean and healthy environment, yes. it helps fortify our judges. And our judges eventually decided that, of course, under the Constitution, it's probably good policy to control the conditions of children working in factories because you can't just leave it up to the powerful industry. And finally, we now have a challenge on the ultimate public policy issue, standing up for a whole generation of people that are less than 40 years old. And where are most of those people in the world India. that are less than 40 South years Asia. old? They are India by far with 850 million people, a lot more than in the United States. Yes. But do 
do um, citizens have the right to come to court and demand a clean and healthy environment? Yes. It's not so clear right now in the United States anymore. No. But it's clear in India. In the U.S. it's not clear as yet. It's no, and this is part of the reason that Justice Cooper and I are here because it's so important for us to see the way India handles these kind of problems. Very but this is a very, very fundamental issue of great importance. A bunch of interesting points by Justice Wilson. I'll go to Professor Rajkumar. Uh, I want to quickly respond to yes, what yes, Justice yes, yes. Uh, You see, it's very important to also recognize that uh, when you look at our own courts, while uh, Justice Wilson is right to say that the demonstration or recognition of the right to clean and healthy environment in the U.S. context is not so clear. And the Indian context, our courts have consistently recognized that. But we should make an important distinction between, uh, you know, norm creation and norm recognition does not meet norm en enforcement or implementation. Uh, it continues to be the case that a lot of, let's say, uh, you know, directions that have been issued by our courts, uh, recognitions relating to what is right and what isn't, uh, have not been implemented effectively. So we have a situation in our country, and that's a far more Why serious you, yes, situation, yes. in which on a number of issues, uh, particularly in relation to economic and social rights, including on issues relating to environment, the court orders and directions have not been followed. And, the, and there is an exponential rise in the norm creation, yes. but when it comes to actual norm enforcement and implementation, we are slowly becoming a very weak state. And unfortunately, uh, our courts have, don't have enough mechanisms because to a large extent, it's important, uh, Tarun, to recognize that democracies, to a large extent, be, you know, work best when all institutions are by and large performing its role and responsibility ah. without the force of law. In the sense that, as, as a famous jurist said, you know, rule of law uh, works well in societies which already respect the law. Yeah. Uh, you know, so in some ways, if you, if in, in, in environment, it's a very you know, important area because I, all of us grew up uh, in law schools, you know, reading those famous judgments on range of issues where we expanded the rights to jurisprudence, including Article 14 and 19 and 21, which we are very proud of it. But the fact remains that we are increasingly entering into a stage where courts can keep making these normative judgments, yes. but the institutional capacity and executive responsibility to enforce and implement these judgments are weaker, and I dare say, we don't have enough mechanisms to ensure that the executive is held responsible. Very, very important point by Professor Rajkumar. I've personally experienced this because in my career, say about now for about 15 years or so, I have seen that courts have, in a sense, have uh, orders upon orders where they have delved into issues like clearing of garbage from certain societies to supplying water to non-VIP areas where, you know, because water is supplied to certain enclaves in cities where a certain section of society lives where government officers live or, uh, or in a sense, uh, the better off neighborhoods of cities. So all kinds of issues courts have been getting involved into. Of course, not so moto, people uh, have been aggrieved and they have approached the courts. But of course, uh, it is for us to see and many times I have personally witnessed that these orders are not implemented due to sheer executive, uh, well, uh, 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 there can be two kinds of uh, uh, inferences drawn upon unwillingness to implement uh, with whatever they have or simply saying that there is not enough wherewithal to implement. Resources are not. Resources are not there. I'll use the word apathy and indifference. <laughs> apathy and indifference. <laughs> so going to uh, Justice uh, Cooper, and you've uh, uh, seen uh, all other panelists speak, and what would be your last word on this issue? Uh, okay, so two things. Yes. One would be, one of the things I'm acutely aware of speaking to jurists and speaking to lawyers here is how your system, your judicial system may be even more overwhelmed than our system. We have a much smaller population, and I've also, we nowhere near the size of India. Yours is just of such great magnitude. We also have a state and federal system. We basically have more courts, and we have more judges, I think, per capita. And as a result, they don't have the sort of dockets. I was surpri so surprised to hear that the Supreme Court has an immense docket each year. Your yes, Supreme Court. Uh, uh, just for your information, yeah. in India, I think it is uh, 
21 or 22 judges per million of population, whereas it is 125 in US. 125 yes, yes, judges yes. for a million population? Yes, yes. That I, is know in, I know <laughs> under the constitution of my state, you get uh, judges, I think it's one per 50,000 people. That's, that's, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of difference between yeah, our two democracies. Yeah, so that is, I mean, so you have some challenges and some handicaps that we don't have. Infrastructure issues aren't there and you yeah, see the number of judges right. are more. Right. Uh, uh, well, uh, one, but, but one, one question that I have, sure. I mean, it just came to mind purely out of my curiosity. In India, there is a paucity of data which our judiciary can rely upon to deliver judgments. And many a times it's given out of whatever is presented before them. Is mm. that a problem in uh, USA? Or are there enough reports available on various issues which are well researched? Uh, uh, you know, be... Uh, yeah, we have an extensive you know, case uh, when cases are now easily found. It used to be one time you had to only go to a law yes, book yes. and it would be And difficult. that's where I would like to get Professor yeah. Kumar in yeah. because the role of universities is very important yeah. to generate such data. Yeah. What, what, what does so, India so one of the big challenges in India is that not only for courts to make judgments, even for policy making, I mean, evidence-based policy making or evidence-based evidence -based judicial decision making is unfortunately not prevailing because most of it is opinionated. Yes. And it's so when you have an data. opinionated system whereby if you think, like for example, if you are, uh, you know, if you look at today's context, there is of course a legitimate fear among countries around the world about, I'm just giving this as an example, coronavirus as a major yes. challenge that we are facing today. <coughs> now, if you look at, and if you base this current prevailing you know, phenomenon hmm. for policy making, you might end up getting very skewed results because we know that in India, approximately 650 people die every day due to road accidents. Yes. 650 people die in road accidents every day. You calculate that, we're looking at 1.5 plus uh, lakh, lakh per uh, annum. Bit. I've actually come pretty close to being one of those trying to cross <laughs> the street in <laughs> Delhi. So, <laughs> 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 That's it. Especially when we look the wrong, we, we look when you cross, we look the wrong direction. So I'm going to make sure I'm not one of those. <laughs> but but if you look at, for example, some of these diseases, say the current ones, the number of deaths are far lesser. Now, what I'm trying to say is that we need to have a robust evidence-based policy making, but also judiciary to be presented with the data. Unfortunately, the both in terms of legal research, lack of scholarship in relation to academic writings are relatively lesser because, and hence, judges also are most of the time presented with information from both sides of the lawyer and whatever they have, they have community to and whatever yes. they could there at class. See, the good thing is now on some of the projects, yes. I would commend many law schools, their law school, including some national law schools. Yes. And the students are taking those projects. They are coming out with yeah, data? empirical research uh, uh, and on that basis data. And uh, in some of the cases, they have intervened and they have provided their data to the courts. I think Judge like Wilson, on, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. And they have cited, yeah. for example, the National Law School yeah. in yes. Delhi, Delhi on the on death penalty death matter, penalty, yes. on the 377 General yes. Global Law School's own faculty yes. members. I mean, so this is, but in a country where there are 1600 law schools and so much of need for this kind of, you know, research coming out, Unfortunately, it's woefully inadequate. And I, I would, I would I also, also before I go to Justice I'm Cooper, sorry. no, 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 before I go to Justice got Cooper for a question, excited. I would like to also make a point that the industry's involvement, uh, industry has been wanting in its involvement in a sense to invest in these schools to fund such projects. I don't see industry in India really coming forward to fund such studies in universities, which I think, think may be common in USA. I am not aware. No, you are absolutely right. I would call it not just industry, generally the corporate business sector, including law firms, corporations. They don't fund, business they don't fund these studies. They have seen law schools at best recruiting grounds for their you know, that's all. That's it. They don't see this as you know institutional yeah, yeah. ecosystem. But but I research. see now little silver lining. Few law firms I have seen. They are, are they are associating. Uh, no, no, I'm uh, not going uh, to uh, Justice yeah. Cooper, and uh, we have little time left, so we'll go for a final round of questions. Uh, uh, should courts be in the business of a making policy, uh, or do you think that courts don't want to make policy? It is thrust upon them by executive inaction. And they are, you know, forced to play that role. And there have been many cases. For example, in India, uh, there was, so there is big corporate lobbies which, uh, in a sense, have, have disproportionate influence on governments across the world. 
Uh, case in point is the midday meal program or the school food program where many a times many corporate lobbies talk about serving children biscuits instead of nutritious meals. And you have had courts, uh, courts stepping in, in, you know, in a sense saying, no, no, this policy is not right. You can't serve children biscuits, you better serve them meals. But this is a very small example. It can be in industries as diverse as mining uh, to water supply. Uh, how would you look at this whole issue of courts making policy or interfering in policy making by governments? I think the way I would look at it, look at, at this question is that certainly in the U.S. courts have been in the forefront of social change and piggybacking on your question about law schools yes, and data. Yes. Some of the material that courts have relied on, some the most valuable material have been law review articles done by students because in law schools, that's where some of the greatest ideas come. You have young people who are confronting ideas. And so some of the social change and kind of decisions that are distinctively moving, progressive, what's called them progressive, rely so much on law review articles. And I think uh, Justice Wilson You, you would have agree. relied upon them right. for a lot of But in, yes, absolutely. But when you talk about social change, one case comes immediately to mind. I think Michael would agree. Brown versus Board of Education. And that was a situation where we, as one of the vestiges of slavery, which was the worst stain on our history, we had an, we had an enduring stain, and that was legal segregation. Not de facto, actually legally ordered desegregation. We had separate, quote, separate but equal schools that, of course, weren't equal, and they couldn't be equal because when you had black children and white children going to different schools, it was just wrong. It wasn't what we, what we as a society needed. It was unfair. It was discriminatory. But that wouldn't have changed, or it certainly wouldn't have changed as fast if it was left up to, legislat uh, to legislatures. It wouldn't have happened, never would have happened in the South. It's hard to say if it would have happened anywhere. But it was because of a constitutional, excuse me, a constitutional interpretation that was unanimous by the Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education that we had a sea change in this country. So in the US, that is, I think, the prime example of how the course of our society changed as a result of judicial, you can call it intervention, you can call it policy making. I would prefer Even to call it, interp I would prefer to call it interpretation of the principles of our con of our constitution. So you call it a living constitution? And that is a major debate that's going on in, in the <laughs> United States. Tech, yes, as I just created, said, textualism versus <laughs> or, uh, yeah. originalism. Yeah. It is, and then you, there are those who say, no, you can't just be stuck by the words, or you can't just fixate <coughs> what did a bunch of and, very smart and noble people in, back in the 18th century think, you can't look at that, time has changed. You have to look at it in terms of an evolving constitution, a constitution that changes. So courts to meet have, the, have the very difficult task of treading that path? Absolutely, and, a lot, and there is a huge division between judges as to how, what methods applied, and, and I'm sure you question. have that is, as well. There's a debate going on even today for the yes. last number of years in the United States, yes. and the judges are divided, judges are whether divided. to go by the text of the Constitution and originalism means the Constitution in 1776 or 77, whether we should be stuck to, to that period words. and what was the framers of the Constitution thought about a particular yes, provision, yes, yes. or it should be a living Constitution, uh, and we have to give the interpretation in today's times. But Justice Cooper, mm. do you face that dilemma when you give uh, are sitting in judgment on so many cases of relevant importance. Do you have that dilemma in your mind? I think we always have that dilemma. And you I do? think that's it because you, we are not there to make the law. We're not there to write the law. We're there to interpret and force. But the question comes up, interpreting a living constitution might be a lot different in than Indian interpreting a, a, written, a, tipping a static but how would you see it in the Indian context? You see, and I, I, I was telling you three stages, yes. and I had not come to third stage. I think this is relevant to third stage yes. of the PIL. When I said first was for the underprivileged, underprivileged and all those. Yes. Second was when uh, of a natural <coughs> environment and the protection of uh, yes. that. And the third phase, if you see, in last uh, 15 years or maybe 20 yes. years, that is on good governance. Good governance. That is where the court thought, and of course, going by that this is, this is what is expected of the uh, executive. 
and uh, uh, of governance of the country and when i said to you about the uh, directive principles of state policy etc which uh, uh, i mean all these things of welfare measures are expected of the executive and likewise day to day governance also where the court started uh, uh, enforcing that principle of good governance now in that sense you take the example of 2g yes. take the example of coal yes. uh, cases etc where these uh, uh, i mean coal mines leases were given or 2g spectrum which was assigned yes. etc but the court found in those cases that look the manner in which it was distributed it is not a bounty that it is not the will of the uh, executive that person sitting there should uh, if i like your face i should give it to yes. you or if yes. i like a, a ex, yes. uh, i don't like uh, rajkumar i should not give it to him so therefore it has also to be governed by the principles which are there in administrative law yes. and which are well recognized principle how administration should be run yes. now here sometimes what happens it is uh, I, i would say again there are two uh, I, i mean streams of cases one is where fundamental rights or human rights of the people were to be enforced yes there sometime policy is also made take vishakha case vishakha yes yes where the court said that it is a sexual harassment at workplace women's uh, harassment uh, sexual harassment at workplace and the court found that there is no law although india was uh, signatory to sida yes but no domestic law is uh, framed on that so how to implement it yes. so that uh, so in the cases of human rights the court has gone to that extent and have even in that case the court said that this would be the law till the time parliament enacts the law oh. so court even assumed the power of the legislature and enacted the so law so you mean court is merely filling up shoes where the executive has no the, this may be that second thing which has to bridge between the a uh, 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 gap between the a uh, bridge the gap between the law and the society yes so it may be that society needs it law is not there and we are telling the legislature the, but what i am telling you is what i wanted and say second case transgender where i, I, I was party to that yes. judgment yes. and we said that there is no law for them yes. and this should be the law till the time so in both the cases no laws are made by the parliament so therefore th that is one but when it, it has come to <coughs> what i wanted to tell you was that when it has come to the enforcement of fundamental rights or human rights and the courts have overstepped yes. that has been welcomed welcome that because vishakha judgment is one judgment which was uh, i mean uh, which got uh, accolades throughout the world and that's why and even today people say about that yes for the rights of the women and uh, to give them their rights it's a milestone no doubt about it but when it comes to day to day administrative functions of the government and that power is assumed by the you courts you mean water power garbage yes, yeah, yeah. all that 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 is not liked by the executive particularly but, of course but, but, subject but to because your, we are out your, of time but yes. i need a 30 second quote from you even though it's not liked by the executive but if you see the people suffering crying for help to the courts should the courts turn a blind eye is what i want to ask no i i i would i would say court should not turn the blind eye but remedy is and which i will quote and i like that uh, rajkumar had uh, written that article in uh, once in one newspaper about 2 years ago yes. that take that yes. cause do it but instead of doing it yourself involve uh, the executive and make them do that task okay okay so so that it becomes That's their task part. you are not en uh, encroaching upon their power also but you are enforcing them to do that okay so since totally uh, out of yes. totally yes. out of time Quickly, but quickly i want to respond on one matter yes. on the matters relating to courts deciding on economic matters in yes. fact justice sikri has a very good judgment on that i have increasingly seen that the even the highest court making mistakes okay unfortunately the courts don't have enough uh, methods to assess the economic matters yes. carefully they absolutely don't do law and economic analysis they simply use their traditional understanding, understanding of, of law and unfortunately serious substantial matters that involve economic apparatus in the entire state be it in 2g or coal or many others that i have commented uh, oh, in no, yes, the no, program in your previous okay <laughs> uh, he has a very good judgment on that but those cause irreparable damage, damage to the yes. economic status of the country yes. and once the courts decide something it becomes very difficult for executive to do anything else just a secret had a very long comment on it in our last show so and if you uh, look at the european experience today whenever when it comes to economic matters courts are constantly looking at law and economic analysis and we need to bring that into that's where data also comes in because empirical data is needed in which we don't have justice wilson the last word from you on the show uh, 
should judiciary be in the business of making policy or is policy making thrust upon them by executive inaction? Policy making is the duty of the court as directed by the Constitution. Yes. And that policy making is something that's expected by the people to decide what does justice mean yes. under the Constitution? What does the right to privacy mean? What does the right to a clean and healthy environment mean? Those are policy decisions that are required by the court all the time. And to me, this is a red herring. Courts obviously have to make policy decisions, but a more interesting question would be, how do they do? Because who else stands up for the disadvantage? Yes. Who else stands up for those who are the victims of the law being applied improperly? So I would say in the overall context, the degree to which policy is per, decisions are made is extremely healthy let's put it that way, and anticipated by the Constitution. Okay, the frank observation by Justice Wilson. So uh, that's it for this episode because we are totally out of time, but I would like to thank uh, all my panelists today, Justice uh, Cooper, Justice Wilson, for especially coming down for our show on a special request, uh, Professor C. Rajkumar for, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, ideating for this episode. In fact, uh, uh, I may like to acknowledge his contribution uh, to the ideation of topic because we're generally not used to discussing episodes in, in a sense now we compared judiciary and democracy in uh, these two nations, uh, which is a, not the usual episodes that we do on legally speaking. Uh, Justice Sikri, as usual, has been kind enough uh, uh, at a very short notice to participate uh, on the show. And uh, thank you, viewers, for watching us and supporting us. And we will be back with more such episodes. But that's it for now. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.